Hello, this video is focused on what I'm calling advanced Mendelian Punnett squares. These are still things that follow the basic Mendelian structure, which means there's going to be a clear case of one trait being dominant and the other trait being recessive. The difference here is that I'm not giving you as much information directly in the problem. If you remember the last one uh, that, that was used as an example, I came right out and I told you what trait was dominant, what trait was recessive. I even hinted in the problem with which letter to use to represent those dominant recessive traits. In these problems, there's less information presented to you, and you have to infer more from the information that is presented. The thing I want you to remember is to still follow the same steps as last time. So we'll go through this problem together, and I'll show you just sort of how to work your way through answering these things. Um, the first step I always recommend is just going through and reading the problem to get an idea of what it's talking about. So this one says, a heterozygous pea plant with axial flowers is crossed with a homozygous pea plant that has terminal flowers. What are the potential offspring? If you remember from last time, the first step is to figure out what's dominant and what's recessive. Now, in the last problem, I came right out and told you what was dominant and what was recessive. In this problem, if you notice, it doesn't say directly. So you have to figure that out from the information that's presented. One of the clues for this is the heterozygous individual. Remember, heterozygous, the prefix hetero, means different. That means this individual is going to have one of the dominant alleles and one of the recessive alleles. Because of that, a heterozygous individual is always going to display the dominant trait, because remember, dominant overpowers recessive. So in this case, you know if something is down there and it's listed as heterozygous, then its trait is going to be the trait that is dominant. So if we follow this, it says the heterozygous pea plant with axial flowers. So that means that axial is our dominant trait. So we'll fill that one in to start things off. And then it says we've got a homozygous pea plant that has terminal flowers. Well, if you remember, there's two options for homozygous. It's either homozygous dominant, meaning it has two of the same alleles, two dominant alleles, or it's homozygous recessive. Um, homozygous recessive means it gets a recessive allele from both parent. We can tell that this one is homozygous recessive because its flowers are terminal. If it was homozygous dominant, it would have axial flowers because we figured out from the heterozygous one that axial is the dominant trait. So we know from that one that the recessive trait is terminal. Now, if you remember from before, the next step is to figure out the parent genotype. The key to genotype is that you have to know both alleles for the parent. So we'll go back to our first one. It says a heterozygous pea plant with axial flowers. Since it's heterozygous, we know that both of the alleles are different. And as far as the letter goes, remember, you pick the first letter of the dominant trait. So it's always good to write things in here. This is always where you're going to look for the letter that you'll be using. So we know that we're using the letter A. Since this one is heterozygous, it has one dominant allele and one recessive allele. So that will be capital A, lowercase a, for that parent. The other parent, it says up here, it's a homozygous pea plant that has terminal flowers. Since terminal's recessive, we know this one's going to be the lowercase a. So now, if it's homozygous, remember prefix homo tells us they're the same, so it's lowercase a, lowercase a for our second parent. The next step, if you remember from uh, the problem we did before, is to put things in the Punnett square. So I'm just going to slide this over a bit to get us some room. I always take the first parent, put that one on top of the chart, the second parent, put that one on the side, although honestly it doesn't make any difference, but I do recommend that you just fall into a pattern with this. Uh, the more you develop a pattern and a routine to answering these problems, the easier it's going to make things for you. So we'll put the first parent along the top of the Punnett square, second parent down the side. And again, if you remember from before, you just figure out where things intersect, and you draw them in on our Punnett square. It's just like those little multiplication tables you used to have when you were a little kid. Uh, so in this one, we've got capital A, lowercase a. Same thing over here. Actually, that's incorrect. <laughs> erase that one. We've got two lowercase a's. So if we're looking at how these intersect, we've got a lowercase a and a lowercase a. Down here is where we have our next capital and lowercase. 
and then over here we have two lowercase a's. So the next step, uh, if you remember from before, is to figure out the offspring genotypes. In this case, we have two different options. We have the heterozygous one, capital A lowercase a, so write that one over there. And then we also have homozygous recessive, two little a's. If you want to separate these with commas, you know that's fine. I'm going to slide this back over so we can finish writing on this chart. The last thing is the offspring phenotype. Uh, if you remember the key to this, the key to genotype, think of it as genes. So the, the alleles are telling you about the genes of the individual. The offspring phenotype tells you what it physically looks like. So we've got to figure out what this one looks like. Since it has one dominant and one recessive allele, the dominant allele takes over and it will have axial flowers. Apologize for my handwriting. It gets tough, especially with the smaller uh, ink size here for the pen. But then, if, uh, if we're looking at the other one, our other genotype, we got two lowercase a's. Remember, that's the only way to get a recessive trait is if you have two of the recessive alleles. That means this one is terminal. So if you can fit both of them in the box when you're answering these, that's fine. If not, you can just sort of write it below like I did. Uh, so for this one, since the parents end up showing both traits, we see that the offspring are showing both traits as well. But that won't necessarily always be the case. Um, one other thing to point out, when it comes to the probability of getting certain offspring, each box on the Punnett square represents a 25% chance probability. So with these guys, since it has two boxes for capital A lowercase a, which is heterozygous, which would be axial, they actually have a 50% chance of having offspring that have axial flowers and a 50% chance of having offspring that have terminal flowers. So it's a perfect 50-50 opportunity. Uh, that won't always be the same. So that's something you'll have to go back and look at depending on the example that you're working on. Um, the key to this is that these are a little bit tougher. You have to now read into the descriptions in the question in order to figure out the traits of the individual. This is why I was trying to stress with you that you really need to be comfortable with the vocabulary. If you know what heterozygous and homozygous means, you can use that information to figure out what's dominant, what's recessive, and then also the genotypes of the parents. So you have to be very, very comfortable with the terminology of this chapter in order to be successful going through and completing these problems. Uh, now in class, you'll be practicing with a lot of these. You have a great opportunity to ask any questions. So if you get to a problem and, and you get stuck somewhere along the way, definitely make sure you take the time to ask. I will certainly be around, and I'll try to help everybody as quickly as I can. Uh, so this is definitely a, a good one to maybe go back and watch a second time to make sure you're understanding where everything's coming from. Uh, in the previous video, I wrote down the steps for you. I would definitely recommend like having that on a small piece of paper along with you so you can refer to those steps. If you notice, I followed the exact same pattern with this video as I did with the last one. So it doesn't matter how complex or how simple the Mendelian problem is. You still go through the same process to answer it. And if you have that process you know, memorized and down to a routine, it makes things easier. So as always, I appreciate you watching and take a minute to answer the questions when you're finished. Thank you.